All right, Mr. Jordan Shanks, we're good to go? Yeah. We are here with Mr. Jordan Shanks, friendly Geordies. Jordan, how is Melbourne treating you so far? Yeah, it's been pretty good. Think so? Yeah, I like Melbourne. Have you noticed? Mm. Look. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay not to like Melbourne. I'll say this. Yeah. Why is it so flat? <laughs> I just uh, I, I look. It, this is a city where it's kind of like New York, where you have to know Fifty Third Street, and you have to know the names mm. of places. But Sydney is so poorly planned that you have to go by landmarks. And so, I, my brain is more nomadic than you people. Like yours is actually a Roman city. <laughs> 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 There's structure to it. In Sydney, you're just climbing up hills the whole time. That's what it feels like when I was there. Yep, that's exactly what you're doing. But those hills have statues on them, you know? And so you know you, you just, that's how you get around, I'm telling you. Have you noticed in uh, the audience you've performed to, and I was speaking to Lewis Spears about this, where is there a kind of scarring in Melbourne? Do you notice a little bit of, bit of PTSD from the last 12 months, or you reckon it's the same as Sydney audiences? Um, yeah, actually. You can notice it, but I choose not to sympathise. <laughs> <laughs> They do have that though, don't they? They're yeah. um, they're not, they're not the same. But whatever, fuck them. <laughs> I, I, I just think, man, just I, I think just ignore it. You know why? If you overthink I, it, you get in your head, especially on stage doing stand up. If you start thinking about, oh, they're reacting like this because of this, or they're doing this because of a pandemic, <laughs> then yeah, you should start focusing. <laughs> I've heard comedians say that. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, there might be some truth to it, but yeah, okay. You can use that excuse, I think, for two shows, and then I reckon when you get to your hundredth gig, yeah, it's, it's still probably the jokes. same response. So, a meeting on Good Friday. So, I appreciate you coming in. Um, the contrast is fitting. So, Scomo is at church probably now, yeah. um, and you're at an apartment block that used to be a school, <laughs> doing <laughs> shows in Melbourne. <laughs> um, Six weeks out from the election, what's your kind of, like, inclinations? I know you're pumping out content. What do you, like, do you see anything that you think the media isn't seeing or that no one's commentated on yet? Is there a particular intuition that you think? They're not talking about this, uh, and I don't know why. In fact, the only ones that are is Sky News. Sky News have the best election analysis in the country, hands down. You know who else? And, and cream of the crop, now that he's gone anyway, though, but Alan Jones... That guy was the preference whisperer. I'm sick of this fucking Anthony Green shit. I hate how he's such a meme in the ABC. He's just like, what is it? I look like a leprechaun. Well, why am I paying for your existence? <laughs> what, you get you get a fat salary because I see you once every three years, and then after <laughs> every other paper in the country calls an election, you go, um, yeah, yeah, no, no, I've, I've verified it. You <laughs> verify Australia. You. I, I Man, I really... Fuck, I hate that man. Sorry, but like the point. <laughs> but Alan Jones, mm. before every election, says, mm. here's where the seats are going to go. And mm. they go that way every time. And he calls the election <coughs> when mm. like two seats are in. Mm. He's, a, he's, a, he's a preference whisperer. He knows what's going on. And that's what I'm quite terrified about in this election mm. is, okay more people in the cities hate Scott Morrison than they did last time. They don't live in the rural seats that they need to win. So it could actually turn out exactly the way it did in 2019. Maybe, and this because when I talk to people in Labor, I'm always asking, where are the seats? And the response that I get every time is, oh, well, we're just hoping these ones boil over from the general malaise of everyone hating Scott Morrison. So that's what they're banking on. It's not as good as what you think it is. I'm hoping that it's better, but I don't know. It's just, again, when it comes to polling, who cares really? Because it's only one polling day that matters. <laughs> 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 Even I found like I grew up in Geelong and that was like the most marginal seat in Australia, Karangamite. So in high school you had like the farmers who would like just inherit their vote. They're like, I'm voting Liberal National forever because my great grandfather did way back to when. Yes. And then you'd have kind of medieval blood. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then you'd have like the labor voters. Often people would move to Melbourne to Geelong because their parent had got a job at like TAC or some bureaucrat job. Yeah, yeah. And so you had that interesting mix. So I always find like Geelong's like the Ohio of Australia. Like whoever wins mm. that seat often wins the election, weirdly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think, like I've spoken to friends who, yeah, they're like living in inner city Melbourne and they're like, ScoMo's 100% going to lose. But I reckon if you go out to the regions, they're still like, it's almost like better the devil you know. They're like, no, we know ScoMo's a suburban dad who fucks up a lot, but we're not going to trust Albanese, who we think is a communist <laughs> in charge of our money. Do you sense that at all? Yeah, it's always the case. It's always the case. It's just everyone thinks that everyone thinks like they're electorate. Mm. And sorry, but uh, no. <laughs> The, the, if you if you look at Parliament, uh, not everyone in Parliament is from Adam Bant's party. Sorry, <laughs> Fitzroy. <laughs> so I, I look. I am not optimistic. I'm going to have a punt on them. I'm mm. going to the TAB and I'm betting on Labor. But that's just <laughs> you got to believe, you know. But man, you would think after three massive fuck ups. They'd be further ahead in the polls than they are now. I mean, 10 points, yeah, okay, it's more than Gillard. But my God, like, I I know that everyone always says this is the most insert insult prime minister of all time. He would have to be the most incompetent prime minister this country's ever had, at least in living memory. At least as long as I can remember, I cannot recall someone... I mean, look, even Malcolm Fraser, for Christ's sake, like, okay, he, he tanked the economy. But, like, I think he would have the sense to order the right vaccine, mm. you know? Mm. Well, so d- it's just, he's just another level, and it's amazing to me that there is still a way that the press can kind of move everyone's mind around this point. Yeah, he's a shithead. We agree he's a shithead, but everyone else in the Liberal Party is extremely competent, and they're the reason that you're alive in COVID. They, they're the ones that did it because they're the party of adults, but somehow they elected the only cunt in the party. Everyone else is just super. So th- what they're setting up is even if they lose this election, it is not the same... It's not, it's not what they're saying in, say, a Kevin Rudd election where it's Kevin Rudd's a psychopath, Everyone in the Labor Party are these shadowy figures that backstab each other and are really corrupt, and you have to kick the whole lot out because the rot is right through the party. That is not what the press is saying now. They're agreeing with the public because it, it's such a creepy, sinister way of controlling the public. It's just like, okay, we can't change your mind on that, but we can use that to make this point, and you see it reflected in how the public respond because everybody knows it's a meme online now. Mm. Yeah, Scott Morrison's a shithead. Mm. But Anthony Albanese is a great guy. But can he protect us from China? Mm. That's how everyone thinks. And the reason that everyone understands that is because that's what their parents are saying. And the reason their parents are saying that is because their only source of news is the Today Show. Do you think that Australians more than other countries inherit their votes? If your parents voted Labor, you will vote Labor. If your parents voted Libs, you will vote Libs. Yeah, obviously, because it's again, it's a, it's like a tribal cultural thing how you vote. But the press definitely have the final say on all of this stuff. If, for instance, I I, I think I, it's it's like these are very rough, but it's pretty much just thirty percent of the population are diehard Labor voters, thirty percent are diehard Lib National voters. You've got a forty percent margin there of people that kind of just feel strongly one way or the other. It's a spectrum, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and those people are the people that shape elections. And if you have complete control over the press, it's very easy to sway those people that are somewhat indifferent. Do you ever think that, because I know like, and I kind of learned this from you, is like the Murdoch monopoly. Do you think that gets you, is that overused ever? Like does Murdoch have less power than people think or more power than people think? Way more power than okay. people this is the This is the meme of someone who doesn't think they're influenced by Murdoch. <laughs> I don't read Murdoch's papers, therefore I'm not influenced by Rupert Murdoch. What they don't understand is that every journalist in the country gets their directives mm. from The Australian. 
there's an example that I used in my previous stand-up show, which is China invented newspapers in, what, I don't know, fucking 2000 BC or whatever. It was like 5,000 years ago. The reason they invented them is because the empire had expanded so much that the emperor couldn't get his message successfully out to the provinces. So they invented newspapers as a sort of hear ye, hear ye, here is doth decree of the emperor. That is exactly the function of newspapers. They were invented to spread the message of the emperor. The emperor is Rupert Murdoch. And so when you see... It is amazing. If you read... It's my other catchphrase. If you read The Australian Today, you know exactly what the news will say tomorrow. You read The Australian Today, Lee Sales on the 7.30 report will be regurgitating points that she has read in The Australian. Carl Stefanovic will be regurgitating points he's mm. read in The Australian. Obviously, Sky News will. Mm. It seeps throughout the entire press ecosphere because they understand this is the whole point of papers. Yes, they're not profitable anymore. What they are, though, is scripts to people on radio and television, which mm. is where most people get their news. So it sets the precedent for the media cycle of that day? Yeah, absolutely. It is yeah. what's known in media bias studies as the agenda setter. This is the whole thing. When people say bias in media they're always talking about uh you know uh th this this fucking paper's left wing whatever that means or this outlet is right wing and it's no those are abstract words that are completely meaningless that is not how the press works and it doesn't really matter either if they have a pro labor or liberal slant what matters is we're deciding that this is going to be the news for the next five days. A really good example of that is Anthony Albanese not forgetting a cr some fucking stat, which is what they do every election. They just start hitting them with gotchas, which I've got to say is a good sign that they're actually... Scott Morrison is maybe more hated than the polls are suggesting, I hope anyway, because yeah. every time he gets gotchied, mm. it's by a member of the public, and yeah. he's terrified of being around the public, and he's constantly around members of the military and members of the press like it's he's a dictator <laughs> right like it's just all these clean shots of him around like inspecting a tank that's, that's true i didn't think about that <laughs> <laughs> well what did you think about the media party like that viral tiktok i think it was addison and he shared that and i think you shared it as well where scomo was at a media party and then this true blue <laughs> aussie <laughs> walked in and tried to get like a impromptu interview and then the AFP came out and followed the kid out to the front. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Like, is that normal? Like having, you know, politicians fraternise with media and should that oh, be normalised? I mean, it absolutely is normal. Mm. It is normal. But this is what I'm saying. The, the, the whole nexus where people have this idea ingrained in their mind, it's so self-serving that the press are there to uh, hold politicians to account, to hold power to account. They're the fourth estate. What more evidence do you need than that is a complete narrative invented to keep people in a hypnosis, to keep listening to their lies, to keep getting them to vote the way that they want them to vote? Because he is sitting there using your money mm. to have a, a function party <laughs> with a bunch of press journalists that has to be kept from the public and the press, the ones that are supposed to be exposing all of these lies and, uh, you know, the misgivings of the prime minister, are there drinking fucking cocktails yeah. with him. It's like, it's just, look, the world makes a lot more sense when you realise that the reason that the press use the word story is because that is exactly what it fucking is. They yeah. are inventing a narrative. And then everything after that starts to just get dispelled. I can't tell if you dislike... ABC journalists more or Sky News journalists? No, oh, ABC. Yeah. Far, <laughs> far more. Way more. Because at least the Sky News journalists have flavour. <laughs> it's like, dude, what, what would you prefer? It's addictive. A, original yeah. Sakatars or Chile? <laughs> <laughs> Sky News is really entertaining. You can't turn away from it. Whereas on the ABC, the journalists at the ABC, because they would know you by name and I imagine they'd be discussing, surely like at luncheons and stuff, they'd bring up Jordan Shanks as, as someone that I don't know they want to take down or someone who they're wary of. Does that ever play into your zeitgeist that you have these kind of, for lack of a better word, enemies within, within the, <laughs> <laughs> within the Australian what. press? 
this is a constant pushback with me and my team because they're always <laughs> saying you should be going after politicians, and I think but I just hate the press so much more. I don't know. Every time I think about Scott Morrison sitting there and engineering taxpayer money mm. and getting all of these, you know, decrepit cunts in a room to uh, do his bidding, I think well, uh, he's an alpha at least. Mm. But everybody, I really do not like the idea of a sycophantic press sitting there uh, exchanging the, the the future of the country's welfare. For a sixty thousand dollar check, it's just—I mean, how cheap is your soul? But anyway, sorry. Uh, yes, it does give me unwarranted satisfaction <laughs> knowing <laughs> that a bunch of prominent journalists are both terrified and <laughs> resent the fact that I exist. I uh, nothing makes me happier. Well, I love that your your demographic because my brother, who's like. He's just like a pot smoker from Geelong, was a drug dealer for a while, doesn't seem engaged in politics. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, man, I love friendly Geordies. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, what? That's my people. He's like, I love friendly Geordies. So you're hitting every demographic. I think you're hitting, you know, people who went to uni, but then you're also hitting like people who just from the suburbs who weren't interested in politics. And now, you know, I think like Yilmaz was the gateway drug and then you kind of opened them up to the Australian political landscape. Do you ever look back on that and reflect and go, holy shit, I've brought... <laughs> yeah. But it was a roadmap that was founded by John Stewart, so mm. all credit to him. Yeah, and it yeah. was I read a book where the stats were undeniable. It was amazing. John Stewart's The Daily Show was the most educated audience in the United States by a mile. Mm. I'm talking twenty points higher than the New York Times. The New York Times was a distant second. And then it just kept going down, and as you would expect, uh, people that watch Fox News were less informed than people that didn't watch the news at all. Wow. Isn't that incredible? And so everybody, but they were just asking them basic questions about who's this politician? Like, did, things like this. A Fox News listener could not answer if the US had won the war in Iraq or not. Okay. You know? (laughs) I would love to be the... (laughs) That uninformed. There'd be a kind of weird piece to it. <laughs> not I knowing think, anything. The piece would be not knowing it. I th- don't think the piece <laughs> would be that screaming jet coming in with that doomsday bell going, ding, every three <laughs> minutes with this Fox News alert. But the thing is, he was saying, mm. uh, no, it wasn't this. It was some guy that was doing a PhD on him. The, the overarching point was that John Stewart was able to inform his audience a lot better. There was two things for it. It's because joke work allows you to retain the information better. And on top of that, because it is joke work, he's actually trying to get to the truth of the matter because there's actually just an incentive in humour to get to the truth of the matter. And then the other thing was, and this is the thing that I was... What you touched on as well, every one of the other audiences of what I call the cunt glasses, right? Those people... (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. Every one of the Sydney Morning Herald of the ABC with those square SpongeBob SquarePants glasses, little slick back ponytail. Uh, th- those those people make news for those people, which mm. essentially is Tories that think that they're very well informed. That Malcolm Turnbull Tories. That is most of the press, apart from the Murdoch press, which obviously aims at bogans. But mm. the rest of the press is aiming at those as Paul Keating actually says, doctor's wives. Mm. That's who they're aiming for. Boring people that need something not very spicy to discuss around the dinner table. Uh, And they're incentivised actually to make politics as boring uh, and uncombative as possible. And on top of that, just they're obviously incentivised to hide the truth. But Jon Stewart's audience was an incredible class barrier of you had college kids watching you had stoners Mm. you had people working in hungry jacks yeah everyone across uh the socioeconomic strata was watching the daily show it transcended all demographics it transcended demographics Mm. more so than other things do at least and and then except the one demographic which is the same one that i have old people old people Really? My grandma hates me. My dad really likes you. <laughs> Your dad would. Yeah. Your dad would. But if you have... 
okay, if, if, if you remember a time when the Prime Minister got up and the camera quality was, what, 500 times worse than this? Mm. And it had that, like... <laughs> Sound all the time when they were speaking, and they're just being like, "The government's job is to ensure that housing is a right of every man." <laughs> That's a good impression. Yeah. I was proud of that. I was really proud of that. That they that demographic, and then you just see me. Coming on in clown wigs and pulling my <laughs> pants down, it doesn't fit in their mo- mental map at all. Mm. Was there ever a point, like, where you thought, holy shit, like, we've gone too too far? I mean, like, when the fixated persons unit came for Christo, where were you? Like, where did you get the first phone call where they're like, hey, Christo has been taken by the cops? Were you at home? Were you at a, at a gig? Were you writing a, a new video? What was your... No, it was my lawyer which is also became Christo's lawyer, Mark Davis, who is a legend. He's one of the good ones. He's mm. one of those people that when the ABC started going south, thought, ah, fuck it, I'll go into law and mm. actually do something of value with my life. Um, he rang up. And, yeah, at first I thought, oh, okay, this is just going to be a bit of a, I don't know, altercation. We can make a video out of it. and <laughs> Content. <laughs> content. <laughs> Content. Uh, and then he just started explaining what actually happened. So Chris and didn't call you, it was through the lawyer. No, well he couldn't. He was in the he was in jail. His phone got taken, he didn't have anything. No, he was just in his cell. Yeah. And then yeah, it started piecing together through time how sinister that actually was. I can't go too deeply into it. Yeah, but yeah. You know, it, it, it was essentially, and is, as we've said before in videos, it's it's a Stasi. It was a Praetorian guard created by the powerful purely to do their bidding. It is not a police unit. It's every time they're pissed off at someone, they're goons that go out and get retribution. Um, that's when it started to... Because at first I just thought, okay, well, you know... You go to a festival and the, the cops just rough you up or whatever, and it's all part of the fun. You know? <laughs> Hang on, I'm just going to get some more tea. Yeah, sure. yeah, so, Chris, so you thought that initially he was just roughed up by the cops. You didn't think it was to the extent where his family was accosted within their home? No, I didn't know that part. I don't think I knew that part originally. No, I just knew that he was in there, and I think for a few minutes or something i was just thinking okay well you know there's just been some mistake then he was explaining to me that no they also were looking for you uh a few weeks before but i was doing tours so they just came up to my house yeah they came up to your house and were just like oh maybe he's here and if he's here we do the same to chris so that yeah they were going to try and arrest me and it would have been so much worse mm. if it was me because Christo is he's from Gen Z, so he's essentially a cyborg. Like he he's got a camera glued to his hand at all time <laughs> and kind of just sees the world, I suppose, through that uh T eight eight hundred or whatever it is, Terminator being like <laughs> 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 like they all do. And so he was able to film all of that. Mm. And I think as a result of that, really did, because of his quick thinking, I think reversed tyranny by about 10 years because that has resulted in a lot of parliamentary inquiries and a lot of public attention on it, just going, well, I mean, that's clearly gone way too far. And to my surprise, I think that there is going to be results out of it. I didn't think that originally, but there you go. Were you ever worried the media wouldn't care? No, fuck no. But again, I'm not worried because Mark Davis was part of the press, knows how they think, mm. hangs out with these people. And so he is got a sixth sense for knowing what's going to play and what's not going to play. 50 years of experience, you know? When you first saw, and I don't know how much you can talk about this, but this is just like my personal intrigue, like because you talked about John Barilla on YouTube videos. 
Was there a weird thing where you first saw him in the flesh? Was that like a surreal moment? <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to talk about him at all. Okay, yeah. Cool. I can probably say too much about him. Uh, no, nah, I think that was all on public record. Yeah, yeah. Um, What came first? Doing comedy at an open mic or your first YouTube video? How did it all begin? No, I did open mic. And then Neil Cole Hatcar did Australia in two minutes and got two million views. And I was thinking... Why am I hanging out with the same <laughs> six degenerates? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to those shitty open mics, which they have in Melbourne. I'm sure shitty they have in bikes, Sydney as yeah. well. Where it's it's real. It's an existential. <laughs> you start looking inward and thinking about every decision you've ever made that's led you to this pub. Yes, I know that feeling. <laughs> the same dynamic of five guys. One chick, all of them losers, <laughs> all five guys courting that one chick and four of them being successful. Mm. That's the, it's, it's a very sad, it, it's sadder than a cemetery mm. at Open Mic Night. I really, it's the exact opposite of levity, the exact opposite. And you know what else as well? This is the worst thing. They encourage in you terrible jokes and I realised after a while, the reason they're doing that is because every time they sense that you've said a joke that would be commercially successful, there's something subconscious in them that thinks we've got to rub that out because we don't want that person coming out of this crab-in-a-barrel situation. Mm. They want to keep you in there. I don't know why. I, it's just pure jealousy. They, they have been there for a long time and seen other people rise up amongst the ranks. And, then and so they they in, they install bad habits into you. I think it's almost counterintuitive. And so you were at an open mic and you thought, I've got to get out of here and start making content. Well, I just saw Neil Cole Hacker getting 2 million views of something he filmed off a 2009 MacBook camera. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty simple <laughs> equation. <laughs> so then I started going on to YouTube and have been far less successful than Neil Cole Hacker over... 10 years. I think you've superseded him now. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, man. He's been on TikTok. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's... that's I don't get these gigs. I don't know. <laughs> this TikTok stuff does scare me. I really wish that I understood it mm. in the slightest. I I've seen do you do things. videos on, on Gen Z and on, uh, on TikTok because I'm on the cusp of Gen Z and Gen Y. I'm on that cusp where 1996. So I can kind of see what you're saying where you talk about this... And we had this home and away actress on recently on the podcast, and she's very scared of being cancelled. That was the main <laughs> concern. <laughs> hey, is she still on, or is this <laughs> she's an old one? No, nah, it's it's posted. It's been posted. No, 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 no. Is uh, the home and away actress still mm. on home and away now? No. Or did you just interview that old? G- <laughs> 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 no, nah, she's got a new series on like Paramount Plus or something. Mm. But I noticed that, and even with my younger brother and sister who are about 18, 19, it is a big thing where their biggest concern is that they'll say something and that will be shown to them on a screen and it's like, you're done. That's a really big fear. <laughs> Not even in the media space, but just socially. At high school or uni or wherever, it's like, no, you no longer can come to those parties. Yeah. You can get cancelled yeah. socially. People forget that. You know what? I had a friend the other day. <laughs> I can't say his name. Yeah. But anyway, he went to a party. And then his other friend, who was just a complete outcast, he's mm. one of our friends. Uh, and... Man, that that man is a comedian's comedian's <laughs> comedian. He uh, you know, is is hilarious and doesn't know it. Mm. Anyway, he went to this party because my friend went there. He wasn't allowed to go. <laughs> Within five minutes of being there, the guy walks up and says, "Yeah, a bunch of people don't want you here. You're gonna have to leave, mate." And he left. And it was the saddest sentence I've ever heard in my life. He was waiting on the curb for his mum to pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to my <laughs> friend, well, for the last year, I've been wondering if I've been cancelled or not. And now at least I know. And what that <laughs> gave him peace. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you he's not alone. No. Did you find, like, do you get Greens voters and people who are ultra left? And I imagine in Melbourne who come up to you and go... 
whatever, they say something that you've said that's maybe slightly controversial. And how do you deal with that when you get kind of people like that come up and say, oh, you're friendly Geordies? Two words. Fuck off. <laughs> Every time. I just – and also the classic, get bent. Yeah. Uh, but there's nothing else to say because they just – they do. They walk past and they're just saying, <laughs> part of one of your hate refugees. <laughs> so nice to yell at them, get a job. Paul <laughs> Keating was right. And every time, it's it's always a particular type of person, Greens mm. voters. In fact, they there's a lot of uh, research into this now. Those people you think are extremely prominent and powerful and everyone is scared of upsetting them. But the reality is that about 20% of them are people that should be Labor voters and the other 80% are kids of Liberals that went to uni and can't vote for them because they don't do anything on climate change. And so they have made their own little party of, it's such a great term, tree Tories. Mm. And so there's no getting through to them. They just live in their sad little fortified enclave, their personal Constantinople of Fitzroy. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, let, let them lock up there. We'll just, those Labour voters will be the Ottoman Empire and just surround it. I swear to God, I swear to God, I think that that is the case. I, I, mm. Honestly, they are always saying that everyone in Australia is a Greens voter, they just don't know it. No, they're not. No. Everyone in Australia is a Labor voter and they don't know it. And mm. by everyone, I mean 80%, because it's, it's a workers' party, for Christ's sake. The, the Greens are, I didn't know this, mm. uh, but the Greens are the Liberal Party in Canada. The Conservative Party are the Liberal Party there, and they don't have a workers' party. They, they have that one, what's the one that... DLP or whatever it is. No, not DLP. They're, they're smaller one. That is their Labor Party. It has no chance of ever gaining power. But if you really want to see what a Greens party would be like in power, you look at Canada. Mm. That's what they're like. Mm. Uh, anyway, sorry. Well, I think Australians forget, like inner city Australians forget that uh, most of Australia <laughs> hates inner city Australians. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. if and I with good reason. Farmer friends, so I've got, and like if I go to Motawari or whatever... They're like how they'll they'll make fun of me for hanging out in Melbourne. Like that's something like just by virtue of being there. Like I met this Tough one dude who'd never been on a train before. <laughs> 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 He's like when he goes to Melbourne, he drive he drives down <laughs> in his like truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh what? God, so like an eighteen it. hour drive. He's just like, he's just a dude who doesn't leave. He lives like someone in a Mark Twain novel. Like he never moves out of his 25 kilometer radius and he's happy to do that. And he doesn't want any new stimuli coming into his life. Um, but I think a lot of people, and I've had this even in DMs recently, like Greens voters kind of come and come and at me more, which is more than liberal voters. Like Greens voters will say, hey, Absolutely. I don't know. It's weird, but it's so aggressive. Mm. Um, mm. Well, that's the whole thing. I think... Really, most people that vote liberal only vote liberal because they've only ever heard that argument. Mm. They're actually reasonable human beings. Greens voters are not reasonable human beings. And Greens voters, this is the whole thing about them. It's a fucking fashion statement. It's mm. a fashion statement. It's not a political movement. It'll get you laid in uni. <laughs> get you laid in uni. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of just, you know what you are, if you're a Greens supporter, you, you are people that used, you know when goths used to wear those like Pentecostal <laughs> <laughs> necklaces? That's all Not the is. Lewis Spears one. <laughs> Pretty much the Lewis Spears one. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they are going to go after you because to them, politics is an identity. Mm. And to the average human being, politics is not an identity. Politics is who's getting results. Mm. And if you just tell most people, look, it's a simple equation. Labor, best government on earth. Or if you're going to be really critical, top ten. Oh, no. Liberals consistently worse in the developed world. Most mm. people, when they hear that one argument, go, okay, and then they vote that way. But the Greens, and this is, and it's part of this, it's part of their enforcing uh, tactic. It's something that they constantly do in Parliament. I read a Penny Wong quote about it where she was going off at them in Parliament, but she was saying this is their deliberate tactic every time. <clears throat> they always wait for Labor to introduce policy 
and then immediately come out and then say how it's not enough and how this needs mm. to go a lot further and then with, with no actual substance to what they're saying mm. ever. They just keep saying that, oh, they're compromising. And the reason is is because these people have a very simple mental map in their life, which is that... Uh, you know, bo- both of them are sellouts. Both of them aren't doing climate change enough. They believe the memes that the Greens have been selling out because they can't be bothered to read the policy sheets or listen to the arguments in Parliament. Mm-hmm. And so they just eat up those narratives. And I'm telling you, man, it's kind of just like telling emos back in the day, uh, how about you not dye your hair a fucked colour <laughs> and then you might be able to get a job. Like, they... they <laughs> Can you imagine them taking that with good faith? Like yeah. They, 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 you know? It's never funny. There's never like levity in the conversation because I feel like people I know are liberal voters, especially at the older guys, like they're kind of up for having a laugh. You know, they're yeah. not, it's not ultra serious. And I feel like they're almost, you can convert them more than someone who is a Greens voter. Also, I think like, the Greens have... It's this weird paralysis with progressive politics in Australia. It was because the Greens have been sitting on 10% for how many ever years. It's almost led to the Liberals being in power. You know, if that 10% was going to Labor, Labor forms government. No, well, that's absolutely true. And they their counter-argument every time is 80% of our preferences go to the Labor Party. That's great. 20% don't. That's 200,000 votes. Mm. Don't tell me that that 200,000 votes wouldn't have won Labor an extra seat. I, I, I really despise that, how they have this idea that we're making the Labour Party better. How? By putting in a shitter version of the emissions trading scheme that Rudd put in that was obviously never going to be accepted by the business party, uh, the, the business council, and so naturally they're going to get voted out and be in opposition for 10 years and also making the idea of pricing carbon so toxic that it'll never happen. That's how you're making the Labor Party better, are you? By fucking up their very well thought out plans mm. and how they actually understand how the infrastructure of this country runs and how to move it in the right direction, as opposed to a party filled with a bunch of nutbag ideologues. And you know what? It's exa- You know what Paul Keating was saying when he was saying uh, the, the Greens are a bunch of opportunists and trots cooing behind a gum tree that they're the Labor Party. <laughs> <laughs> that is them. That is them. It's a bunch of nutbags. Yeah. These are the two factions. Nutbags and really smart political operators who have mm. realised, I can get a seat in the Greens a lot easier than I can in one of the other major parties. And they have manipulated that party to serve their purposes. When I'm talking about all of this stuff, I'm talking about the Greens of the last 10 years. Under Bob Brown, mm. I was a huge fan of the Greens. Yeah. Massive fan. Because it had one <laughs> agenda, which was we represent... The environment. That's it. Mm. It was a pure party, but it did get eroded by the filth of... It was actually uh, the Australian Democrats, when they disintegrated, all of those operatives moved into the Greens as they okay. realised they're the next third party. Yeah. You know? How do you go with increased fame? Like, from your first YouTube video to now... You know, like, are you walking down the street and people coming up and saying, hey, it's Friendly Geordies, and, and are you getting recognised more and more? Like, how have you gone with that? Does it does it bother you, or do you gravitate towards... I know Russell Brand was like, he wanted to do comedy because he wanted the fame. I don't get that sense, <laughs> which is very honest. That is super <laughs> honest. And also, that man can't say anything else, can he? So obvious. I don't get that sense from you at all, though. No. No. I like the craft. <laughs> uh, it is true, though. Uh, no, I, I just like doing it because I like... Th- this is all that happens when I'm on stage. I sit there and something ticks over mm. and if there's a... you can, I probably actually see it on my face. My mum actually said it once when she went and watched me. She was just saying, like, you can see when a joke doesn't work on stage, you're just sitting there processing why it didn't work. Oh on stage yeah and that's it it's just like i just like it's just like building a table to me it's Mm. the same thing it's just that thing of just like after an hour of doing it and then being like nice finish not bad you know that's it it's just having a finished product that worked what does your mum think of your success i don't know i don't talk to her Tell 
what my dad thinks though. <laughs> I'm not storage wars, so he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I really like, I really like very disinterested Aussie men in their fifties. <laughs> so They're our yeah. Buddhist monks, aren't they? They're just so <laughs> indifferent to everything except the lifestyle channel. So you could say anything to your parents, then they shrug their shoulders. But oh, cool! Even like I fixate a person's unit. Oh, so and so is coming after me now. I got a video that had two million views. They're like, oh, cool! Just keep doing what you're doing. They, they look not at, even that. Okay, not even that. Actually, the, the only thing that my dad will just come in and just, just every now and then just be like, yeah, that video you put up the other day was pretty cringy, mate. And that's <laughs> the most he's ever commented on my career. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. He's, he's, he's not a bad guy. <laughs> he's not a bad guy. I like it. I like that fact. Because you know what else I think? I mm. think... You had parents that are constantly reinforcing how special you are. Yeah. There, there is one thing that you, you see have. it in people, I reckon. You definitely see it in people. But I think in general, you will walk through life with much more confidence and security. Definitely. Mm. But you will never have that hunger that you need in comedy to go to that next level. Mm. I really don't think you will. Because you're, you're kind of satisfied in yourself. And it's not like you won't be a successful comedian. But I'm telling you, your jokes will not be as good. A, because if you go and look at things that really crush on stage, it's always when you are able to push the audience to laughing at something as evil as that audience is accepted to laugh at. That mm. will always get the tears yeah. of laughter, right? And to get to that point, you have to have some kind of dark place in you, which is exactly why that guy that was saying, uh, now I know I've been cancelled, God, I wish that that man was put together enough to do comedy. He would be incredible. Nothing to it. lose. Nothing to lose. Just been at the lowest ebb of his life for a permanent 10 years. Like the exact <laughs> opposite of Arnold Schwarzenegger, just constantly <laughs> losing. You know? That man, that man would be amazing on stage and furthermore he wouldn't have to do anything mm. he would just have to go up and talk i think the audience can sense they can sense those sorts of things and it's also reflective in the audience that you attract isn't it yeah. like if you are light and chirpy you're going to attract a bunch of 14 year old girls like it's one direction yeah <laughs> that's the tiktok audience that's the demographic you need to be hitting yes <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's just like, uh, it's 30 seconds, don't have time to get into any Jeff. Okay, I've got a show. So obviously, like, it's just, yeah, there's not going to be anything mm. more sinister being said. That's my thoughts on it anyway. Well, do you ever worry about things you say? Like, have you ever met a journalist or a politician who you've criticised? Like, have you ever criticised someone, for someone from the Sydney Morning Herald? And it's like, oh, shit, they're here at a cafe or something. I've just bumped into them. <laughs> yes. Really? Far out. But I didn't bump into them. They were just in the cafe and they were pretending not to see me. Um, but you'd done a video was, on them or something. Yeah, and that was a very <laughs> oh nice feeling knowing, just seeing that fear <laughs> in his eyes as I entered the room. That was great. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, there's no one on earth deserves more punishment than journalists at the Sydney Morning Herald. <laughs> Independent or Imagine the mindset of sitting there. Uh, I'm this automaton. I'm the closest thing to AI that humanity has produced. Who owns you? Peter Costello. <laughs> but we're independent. If they offered you a million dollars to do your own show, would you do it for Channel 9? Oh, it depends what it is. <laughs> it depends what it is. If it's just like, the big boy, part two. <laughs> I'd watch that. Yeah, I would fucking... <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of all these... Australian comedy shows mm. that don't exist anymore. I think we really mm. hit our stride in the 90s and it's all been downhill. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Who do you reckon is going to win the election? What's your tip? I think it's going to be Labor. And it, it, this is, it, I'm always wrong about that. I'm the exact opposite of Alan Jones. Um, I think it's going to be Labor. But I think that there's a really good chance that they're going to have to form a coalition with a bunch of mums from Manly. 
That's fucking teal independence. I'll give them this. They're, they're a lot better than the Greens. Mm. I'm glad that they're winning those seats, and I'm glad that they're winning them because they're doing exactly what the Greens should be doing. They should be attacking Liberal seats. They don't because they know it's easier to pick off Labor seats. Mm. So they put all of their fucking money into that. So as Labor's permanently Germany in World War One, fighting a two-front war. So evil. Mm. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think that I think that because the Liberal Party, their demographic, what they used to think their party was, was Malcolm Turnbull and his Saturday morning rowing club. Yeah. They thought that was what it was. Ever since Malcolm Turnbull hasn't been at the head of it, because as we were saying before, there is a huge, huge cultural element to politics. People in the North Shore, people in, I'm assuming, Richmond, I don't know, but whatever the Melbourne equivalent is. South Yarra, probably. South Yarra. Uh, they are abhorred by the current Liberal Party mm. because the current Liberal Party is now controlled by a bunch of bureaucrats who have weaseled their way into power somehow and usually through the shadow element of the government, kind of like your Peter Dutton's and his faction of the Liberal Party. Mm. Um, and so that doesn't resonate with them anymore and they're having to fight all of these culture wars that they also don't resonate with and so they're kind of horrified by what the Liberal Party is. This is the genius of Anthony Albanese was that essentially everybody is saying, oh, you can campaign. Well, look at the fucking polling. Like that man has done a phenomenal job. If all they got was that he couldn't remember a stat off his head over the last three years, that man has done a triple backflip somersault and executed it perfectly. Mm. And because the judges are all biased, they're just going to sit there and be like, two out of ten. But anyway, he's done all of that. And what the Australian public doesn't understand, and he clearly does, is his job as a Labor opposition leader is to tell the elite class, is to tell the lobby groups in Canberra a, a, a secret slogan that we're not all seeing, which is, we're not scary. That's what he needs to convey mm. to the to the ruling class of Australia. He just needs to under, just keep, and he has been essentially saying this in all the press. Scott Morrison is doing a shit job of the basics mm. of governing. Yeah. Well, he's pretty much got, doesn't he, Albo? He doesn't have much policy reform. He's kind of almost Stephen Bradburying the election, like he's waiting behind Scomo. Scomo's tripping over every single coffee table, yeah. and he's hoping then he gets into power, and then. You can start doing reform once you're in power, I guess. That seems to be... And I think that when he's going to be in, he's going to be the Labor Party's version of John Howard, mm. which I'm really excited about because he'll know not to push the envelope like Kevin Rudd did and gradually do things over the next 10 years, which even from... I'm telling you, this is the whole thing. People don't think about these things, but basic, basic things like the Department of Agriculture no longer has people that go out and see if farmers are uh, poisoning your food. The Nationals got rid of that. Yeah. And there's institutional memory loss in that those people have had to go and do other jobs. Good luck hiring them all back, which means that you have to start from the ground up to get the basic services of government functioning again. Even that is a huge win. So when people sit there and say, mm, not doing enough, you're not doing enough to grab <laughs> headlines in the fucking Guardian, okay? What are you going to do when Albo wins? Like, what does your YouTube channel change? Does your content change? You start criticising uh, Albo's mistakes? So what do you do? <laughs> no, Christ. I hate <laughs> this fucking thing of like, oh, you don't criticise Labour, you are biased. It's like, dude, <laughs> can you click into any other channel in the country if you want to see criticism of the Labour Party. Yeah, parties. yeah. It's everywhere. It is omnipotent. I am there to act as a counterweight to prosecute the case mm. that the opposition is clearly, by every metric, a better government and I don't think that they deserve any criticism. Mm. I think that they're pushing this nation forward and you are an insular, narcissistic little shit online. That's what <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that's a great way to end the podcast. All right, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Jordan, thanks so much for coming, man. I appreciate it. And I'm excited to see your show. Thanks, man.
Really keen to see it. Uh, where can people buy tickets if they're in Melbourne? I think this will go up tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, friendlygeordies.com. We've added an extra show for Monday and extra shows for tonight and tomorrow. So there are tickets available for those. Awesome. We're out.